theme of today, it's good to be here, is to talk about joy. Um, turn to your neighbor and say, do you got the joy? And then turn to another, and turn to another neighbor and say, I got the joy. Awesome. <laughs> Some people might be singing that. It's good. So the theme of today's message is inconceivable joy. Inconceivable joy beyond what we can ever comprehend. And our teaching text this morning is going to come out of James chapter 1, 2, verses the 4. Um, let's stand and rise in honor of God's word. Once we find that, we'll read that together. Oh, you guys are quick. Awesome. So out of the NLT of verse 2. It says, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. So James, in context of the church, he's speaking about the development of character. You know, when troubles come, consider it great joy. And he goes on to talk about the virtues and ethics of the Christian church. But among these ethics and character traits that he discusses, he discloses at the onset that this development's going to come at the, in spite of resistance. You know, it's not if troubles come, it's when troubles come, right? But he calls the church to esteem this process, to look at this process of just endurance with great joy. So why joy? What is it about joy that bears reminding to brothers and sisters as they endure the hardships of life, as they endure becoming more and more like Jesus, that process we call sanctification? We, too, have a desire to know what lasting joy feels like, that exuberance of life, that quality of life where everything is rich, everything feels grand, and everything just, it just feels well within oneself. Amen. Everyone else want to feel that way? Or is it just me? Okay, good. Um, so we have this desire to know what joy looks like. However, we may find ourselves going through seasons of life, particularly even this Christmas, feeling joyless. You know, when you're told to smile, go to parties, go through the motions, everything may be fine. You, you may say everything's fine, but is it really fine? You really feel fine. Is it really truly well within you? Do you have joy? So this begs the question of us this morning, and it begs the question of us as we look at our text, how can we find joy in difficult circumstances. When those troubles come, how do we consider it as joy? How are we called to do that differently than how the world calls us to consider joy? So what James invites the church, and what I want to invite us, and as we unpack God's word today, is an opportunity to keep proper perspective of joy, proper perspective as we stay the faith. It's only through our eyes, I'll, I posit, and I just I want to present to us, it's only through keeping our eyes on Jesus that we can know and discover lasting joy. Wouldn't you agree? Amen. Join me in prayer. Father, as we unpack this word together, may, may your Holy Spirit be present amongst us. Uh, we invite you to speak to us, um, to encourage and ch champion us to be more like your son Jesus and help us discover what it means to truly, truly live a life uh, that is filled with joy. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So for us to unpack how joy is accessible to us to Christ, I want to first understand how the ancient world, how the Apostle James and the early church in their day, how did they un understand joy? How did that world understand joy? Um, the sense of joy, euphoria, the picture of the good life, the vita bella, as my paisans would say. Um, so joy, as understood by the Greco-Roman world, was a final destination. It was a primary place, a goal, an ultimate life goal to achieve and to strive for. And to talk about this ultimate goal of joy, they use the Greek word often called eudaimonia, uh, which in the Greek translates to flourishing or well-being, that sense of just everything is right, that perfect objective of just contentment in oneself, contentment in one's circumstances. This was an ultimate goal for the philosophers, for the kings, for people who had any sort of intellectual thought. They'd say, my goal in life, eudaimonia, this ultimate well-joy. In order to get to this end goal, of human flourishing, the Greeks and the ancients, they pursued it by means of acquiring virtue. Virtue, doing good things, thinking good things, eating good things, doing the right thing, being ethical, being moral. And they say that doing things that are beneficial to one's community. And they would say that all of these things, these virtues, would be in service to this larger ultimate goal of my human flourishing, 
of human flourishing, of well-being, of joy. And to some end, yeah, that's great. We want to do the right thing, right? We want to live well. We want to have, no one wants to have an uncomfortable life. Uh, we don't want to go through life on hard mode. We want things to be well for us. We want things, to, we want to coast through. We want it, a picture of life where that is, everything is hunky-dory, right? That's the promise that, that's the promise that retirement may be for some of us. After years of toiling and working, finally, I'm going to get to that idyllic picture, right? This sounds great and all, but we as we as believers ought to remember that it doesn't matter how much good we do, right? Without Christ's redemption, our own righteousness, our own virtue, like what the prophet Isaiah would say, it's like filthy rags. So the apostles, James included, had to articulate the way of Jesus in a world that sought to discover the good life, to discover joy and other virtues by their own human striving. But as we as, we as Christians, as we know the reality of life is that so much of life is conditional, right? We can do all the right things, but if trouble befalls on us, if a random accident happens, heaven forbid, then all of our plans, all of the things, all the plans that we made can go to ruin, right? It doesn't matter how much we try and how much we strive and how much we try to inch our way to that goal for ourselves. We, we live in a random, in a world that is random, in a world that is unfortunate, where we seldom have any control over the circumstances that we're born and situated in. So that begs the question again, as we look inwards from the word to our hearts, how can we comprehend joy today? So this is how the ancients understood joy, but how does, how does 2022 um, East Rockaway, how does the United States, how does this world that we live in today understand joy? Well, like the ancient world, the world very easily sees joy like they did, right? As that final destination, that ultimate, the ultimate objective we want to strive for. You ask somebody, I just want to be happy. You know, I don't care what it is. I don't care, you know, how much, I don't care how much money I have in the bank, although, you know, a couple zeros would be nice. I just want to be happy, you know. I just want to be, how, ma- how many times do we have issues in relationships, issues with internal people where just people arguing, oh, I'm not happy, and then making the choice to separate. It's challenging. The world sees, in that same way, joy is that primary objective. And the worldly response the one that, if we're honest, folks, that we often succumb to, even as the church, um, has two primary results. If we were to follow and see joy as that primary objective of a believer's life, we may, follow, we may see similar results to the world. One of the first results is seeing, we begin to see joy as a commodity. Joy, con- human contentment, human flourishing is seen as something to be developed in the marketplace of ideas, the marketplace of economics. Our joy is very dependent on kind of the things and the places and the people and all the things that we can kind of curate for ourselves, like a dragon den, right? Hoarding their own little trove of treasure. Let me ask you this. Christmas time, what brings us joy? Good food, good parties, richness of life, you know, exuberance, getting to spend time with family, getting to spend money on gifts, receiving gifts. I like like gifts. I like nice things. I'll be honest. All of these rich things other than excess, these are the things that we situate ourselves in at Christmas time, right? But January 1st comes around, New Year's, New Year's Day. What are the things that people strive for? It's no longer riches, excess, it's moderation, budgets, schedules, disciplines, goals. Do you see how easy things shift all of a sudden with the tide? It's such a small example, but it begs, it, it begs the question of look how much more This is pertinent on our lives. Think of the self-help industry. Thousands of different ways to be the best version that you can be. Self-help, the self-help industry is in the secular, quote-unquote secular world, and it's also in the church as well. We we, we can put Christianese onto self-help as well, you know. Pray these three things if you want to be blessed. Pray these prayers if you want the expansion of your territory, of my domain, right? We often put kind of, we appropriate the way of the cross onto the way of the world, not realizing that we are still following the way of the world. Does that make sense, church? This pattern of seeing of the world, seeing joy as a destination, seeing joy as something that's economical. At the moments, it sees these things and it turns all of these moments of life, all of these moments where God is trying to press in, it, it just turns them into stepping stones towards that ultimate goal, towards our own gratification. Right? But Believers, is that, is that the best way to see our joy? 
Let's look at Ecclesiastes. King Solomon muses to himself in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1. He said, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. We'll skip ahead to verses 10 and 11. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all of my labors. But as I looked to everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all meaningless, like chasing the wind. This rat race of life where we commodify and we try to maximize every single moment to the fullest of its potential. As, the, as Solomon says, it's ultimately meaningless. It's like dry grass floating in the wind. And this often leads to that second result, worldly result of seeing joy the way the world sees joy. It turns joy into a futility. Joy is futile. Because this world is often outside of our control, because this world is full of sin, chaos, disease, issues such as abortion, racism, hatred, we often can say to ourselves, we look at everything going on at the news and we say, goodness, is there any point in even looking ahead? It's no wonder why mental health is such a large part of our common vocabulary these days. We live in the world where troubles are so hard and so difficult to bear and to carry on our own. Believers, so this is why it's important for us to be countercultural. Remember, as we say, we don't live, we may be living in the world, but we have to be mindful of the ways that we are called to not live of the world. Amen? Paul says to the church in Rome, in Romans 12, chapter, verse 2, you guys probably know this, we say this very often, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Amen. We believe this, we say this so often, but let's ask ourselves this morning, how? How do we do this? In context of joy, in context of talking over and meditating on this Christmas story together, I want to suggest to us that one of the ways that we live countercultural lives is by looking at joy less like a final destination and more a byproduct of being in the presence of Jesus. Amen? We look at joy less like a destination, that final end goal of our own human well-being, but joy is found incarnate in the fullness of who Jesus is. Amen? N.T. Wright, he says, the early Christians challenged the philosophical tradition of eudaimonia, the ways of that world, not by abandoning the framework of a life shaped by a goal, but providing a different goal. It's right, we're called to not, we're not, we're called to have a goal, but that goal is not just our own joy. It's not just our own human fulfillment. Our joy is Christ. For him, may he receive that glory in our lives. Amen, church. Can we say that with confidence this morning? We no longer live for ourselves, but our goal is to pursue Christ, the only place where we can find joy. Amen? So this morning, we've talked about James. We talked about considering things joy when troubles come, but I want to sidestep from James and just dive right back into that Christmas story. Amen? I want to dive back into our story in Luke and see where the presence of Jesus, like we discussed, in our lives, where we see and discover that as that fulfillment of what our hearts are longing for. Because, because as we know, Chris Church, this Christmas story is indeed one of inconceivable joy. Amen. And I use the word inconceivable, pun intended, because we're going to discover, we're going to unpack the story of Mary and Elizabeth, two expectant mothers of who discovered that presence of God living in our lives. I gave the young adult a sneak peek. I gave them Thursday, but this is, man, this story just gets me hyped. And instead of presenting just kind of like a three point like um, just a sermon with like three bullet, like bullet points and just kind of articulations and going cross-references and all that stuff. I just wanted to read the word to you guys this morning. Can we do that together? I just want to let the word speak for itself and for us to discover that joy beat for beat the same way that Mary and Elizabeth did. Can we do that together? Wonderful. So we're going to enter into chapter, Luke chapter 1. So this is a world, this world pre-Jesus, this is a world what scholars would call that 400 years of silence you may have heard of. This is a time in Israel's history of despair. They were under Roman occupation. There was no prophets, no voices of God leading, guiding, rebuking anymore. It was just kaputs, nothing. People may have considered, is this Messiah actually going to come? Is this promise actually going to come? The more they let that, the more they sat in that despair, the more they sat in that longing. Well, we start the story with two faithful servants of God, Elizabeth and Zechariah. They Zechariah was a priest, and Elizabeth was a member of the Levites. 
And we're going to start our story in verses 6 and 7 of Luke chapter 1. And you keep a, keep a finger there because we're going to keep going back to the story together. Uh, it says, Liz- Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Let's pause right there for a moment. Imagine the shame that Elizabeth must have had, carrying her whole life, especially as a member in a very public position, as a member as the priest's wife, a member of the Levites, unable to conceive her own child. This is still a, childlessness is still a taboo topic today, and still an issue that women may struggle with today. But can you imagine back then, in a society that was far more patriarchal, that shame that she carried. And we see in verse 25 of this chapter that indeed this was a shame that she carried and a shame that once the presence of God intervened was lifted on, off of her. So we have her husband, we have a priest, Zechariah, who'd been ministering in God's temple and where God's presence had long since departed from this place, but he would still come. And on one morning as he was called to, it was his shift to go into the temple, we see how God intervenes. We see in Luke chapter 1, 11 to 15a, we'll read together. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have a great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. See what God does for this couple. In the midst of their longing, in the midst of just this period, see what he does for them, for Zechariah, and for Elizabeth, who wasn't there in the presence. Elizabeth, he's, to Elizabeth, he says, he sends a message. He says, God says, he hears you. God will answer your prayer to restore you. And through that answered prayer, he will do so much more. Amen. Isn't that what God does when he comes onto the scene? We get that assurance that he hears us. We get that assurance that he will answer our prayers and he'll take care of our needs. But then also the wild thing that God does, the thing that is truly inconceivable is that he blesses beyond measure. That he doesn't just give, he gives double portions. And that if we truly, truly seek him, he will reward us. Not for the good things that he does, just simply out of love and out of, out of just pure adoration for us as a son, as a daughter. I want us to take note of this pattern where we see despair and longing. God intervenes, answers prayers, brings joy, and promises so much more. Because we're going to come, we're going to see that pattern unfold yet again in a couple verses over. We're going to talk about Mary, right? We all know Mary, right? Mary, she's usually, she's usually the, blonde, the blonde kid with the, like the blue shawl over her head, maybe sitting on a half shell in some people's lawns. Uh, we all know Mary, right? Thank you. Supporting. So we all, know, we all know the story of Mary, right? The reality of our nativity story, though, while we, we like to decorate it, we make it look nice, you know, we, we, the precious moments, we make it all kitschy and cute. But the reality of this nativity story was that it's very, it was set a moment of joy in a very, very dark time. The reality of Mary's situation was grave. She was a teenage, a teenage girl, maybe 13, 14 years old who at her engagement had to contend with the onset of pregnancy outside of marriage. Now today, that's still, today, I mean, maybe less so, but that's still something that is still is a bit, little bit taboo. But back then, especially for someone as lowly in Mary's station, that was a no-no, right? Mary had to contend with that all of a sudden, just having to contend with that news. And we see that the angel comes and announces to Mary that the same way he talked, we see encounter with Zechariah, that the Lord is with her, that the Lord takes delight in her. Right, we skip ahead to Luke verses 1, verse 28. Gabriel appears to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. And I, love, I would love to hear that, that the Lord is with me. Amen? We also see in the story with Mary, his, her encounter with God, that God has something amazing in store for her. Right, the birthing of Jesus. Jesus is not just any baby, as we know. Jesus is the Son of the Most High. We continue in verses 31. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Amen. What big news is that? Good news of great joy. Wow. 
But at the, at the same time, Mary is aware of her station. She's, a, she's, barely a, she's barely a teenage girl who's just given this great news. And she's, I can imagine, I'm, this is just my imagination going, she's processing. She's not, not out of disobedience, but just trying to comprehend the situation. And we see her ask the angel, how can this be? How can this be? Trying to reconcile this great news, this miraculous glory that is promised with the very human confines of her own personhood, the very human confines of her own situation. Have we ever felt like that before? How is this going to happen, Lord? How is this promise going to be? Let's look at Gabriel, the angel's response in verse 35. He says in verse 35 of Luke chapter 1, the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overpower you. Let's pause there. The power of the Most High will overpower you. In the Greek, the word overpower, it doesn't just translate to like just usurping and translate to kind of smothering. A more closer read of overpower is to, overshadow, sorry, is to envelop. Right? The presence of God is not just, it's magnificent, it's holy, it's reverent, it has power to move mountains, but also this presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit is one that envelops his beloved Thank the Lord that Mary is not just the only favored one, that we have, for those who call upon the name of the Lord, beloved, you are a favored child of God, and the presence of the Holy Spirit wishes and seeks to envelop you as well. You believe that this morning. We too celebrate God's indwelling presence within us. His Spirit filled and, over, and overshadowed Mary, but it also filled the church. It also fills you and I this morning. And as we profess the presence of Jesus in our lives is that presence of joy. We're no longer striving for the joy in of itself, but no, we find joy the more we find the presence of Jesus. Amen? In our text this morning, this is made evident with Mary's encounter, not just with the angel, but in a couple of verses, we read that she goes on to see her cousin Elizabeth. The angel says in the verses, you have to, angel says, you don't believe me, this is the Chris translation, you don't believe me, go look. Your, your, your cousin Elizabeth, the one whom was barren, she's also giving birth. So we read that Mary rushes over. At the sound, Ray rushes over. She hurries to see her cousin Elizabeth. I imagine full of joy. The word says hurried. She rushes with excitement. And we read on in Luke verse 1, verse 41. At the sound of Mary's greeting, so Mary's knocking on the door, right? Mary is coming into Elizabeth's home. They're coming together, this glorious rendezvous filled with the presence and promise of God. So at the sound of Mary's greeting, it says in verse 41, Elizabeth's child, the one that was in her, leapt within her. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. How beautiful a moment is that, mothers, when you feel that baby kick for the first time. That moment of, oh, wow, it's real. Uh Uh-oh, it's real. The morning sickness, the fretting over the baby room, the fretting over the health, going to the doctor's visits, all of a sudden with that kick, boom, ah, real. This is actually happening. This is actually inside of me. Can you imagine that moment of joy that was felt? And this is just just no ordinary baby that Elizabeth was near. This was the presence of the Most High in her cousin's womb. Proximity to Jesus made Elizabeth and John come alive. He left within the womb. Indeed, Jesus was the living proof that God came to live within us. And church, I'm so thankful because what does proximity to Jesus do to us? Does he not make us want to leap for joy? Does he not make our soul come alive? Do you ever feel that stirring of the soul where it's just, ooh, God is present with me. God is doing something. Can you not see it? Even if it's not in me, I, I love seeing that in my brothers and sisters. And in my darkest times, in my times where I've questioned, my times where I felt blue, man, seeing the joy of the Lord come alive in you guys, it makes my own soul stir. Seeing despite your own circumstances, despite your own pain, despite your own loss that you go through, seeing the joy of the Lord makes my soul come alive, church. Beloved, we need eyes to see, we need ears to hear what God is doing in our midst. That is good news. It gives us great joy. So this presence, this presence of Jesus in Elizabeth's Midst gave her great joy. And we see that in verses 42 to 45, Elizabeth exclaimed with a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, a lot of exclaiming here, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. 
In verse 45, it says, you are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. And just a quick sidebar here, a more accurate translation of blessed above all women would actually go on to indicate blessed among all women. And I find that encouraging for us this morning because yes, Mary was faithful. Mary was obedient to the call of the Lord. And Mary may have been the first to know that indwell, one of the first humans to know that what that indwelling presence of Jesus felt like, literally. But I'm thankful that we're not, she's not the last, amen? It's greater that is he that is in me. Greater is he that lives in each and every one of you, Dottie, Donna, Chris. Greater is he that lives in each and every one of you that is in this world. But here we see, with this exclamation of Mary, this confirmation of what the angel had said to her. Yes, she's able to see Jesus dwelling in her. She's able to see Jesus working in her life. See, when Jesus is in our hearts, church, when people, when Jesus is burning within us, people are going to notice, right? You ever have someone go up to you and say at work or maybe at home or just say, like, you changed, you know, you changed, Angela. Something's different about you. Something's different about you, Joe. Something's different about you, Pete. Like you're, you're more graceful. You're more loving. You're more forgiving. Or I, there's just even some, some, something about your presence. There's something about you that is different that I can't put my finger on. It's what an opportunity that is to share the gospel. What an opportunity that is to share that joy that's been welling up within you. Can people say that about us in earnest? That the Lord, wow, the Lord has blessed you. Wow, you're spending time with Jesus, I can tell. Can people say about that us in earnest? Excuse me. When we gather from the story of Mary and Elizabeth, what we gather from this story of just inconceivable joy is that Joy is not dependent on human circumstances. It's not dependent on our efforts, but the power of God living within us, that presence, that indwelling presence of Jesus living in each and every one of us. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7, he describes this power. He describes the glory of God living in frail human flesh this way. He says, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that that great power is from God. It's not from us. What a joy, church. What a privilege to get to host and to get to inhabit the presence of God living within each and every one of us. The story of Mary and Elizabeth, the story of inconceivable joy, tells us this morning of the immense treasure that's living within each and every follower of Jesus. In that same way we we, we read with Mary, we have favor from God if we're, we're a child of God, if we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior. He hears us. In that same way we see Elizabeth being responded to in her barrenness, in her need, we praise a God that is responsive to our needs. He restored Elizabeth's barrenness, and he enveloped Mary. He protected her through social stigma, through the uncertainty of that season ahead. Thank God that he does that for us too, amen? Through a miraculous way that still confounds us, he also promises to bless beyond what's imaginable. He did that for Mary. He did that for for John. They were just not mere children. They were children with a task. For John, who was to preach the word of God. And for Jesus, it was to be the son of God, to die a sinner's death on the cross for you and I. What God is doing in each and every one of us is far beyond what we conceive. Does that not give us great joy this morning, church? Will he not do the same for you, beloved? I want to continue with verse in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. It says that we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but we are never abandoned by God. We are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in us. Greater is he that is in me. That it is the world, that is in the world. But it doesn't matter your past, your trauma, your past sins, your mistakes, your resources, even your age. The promise of Emmanuel, that promise of God with us, is available to each and every one of us all if we accept it, if we accept that call. Church, this is where we can look at circumstances and troubles and consider them joy. Why? Because Jesus is there. In the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the uncertainty, Jesus is there, right there with you. 
So we have this gracious opportunity to discover God's presence in the midst of our trials. In the midst of sickness, we can find joy. In the midst of loss, of our depression, of our separation, of our unknowing, of our uncertainty, we can still say with confidence, church, that it is well with our souls. Can we preach that to ourselves, that it is well with our souls? Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, even so, it is well with my soul. In the same way the presence of Jesus dwelt in Mary, his spirit energizes, it envelops us today. Because we know that Jesus is with us, we have an anchor that holds us together no matter what we are faced with. May we still have that same posture of the Apostle James as he writes to that church, the church in the midst of the world that's looking to make joy that ultimate goal. He's saying, no, 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 no. Look at the trials and consider them joy because Jesus is there. May we have that same posture as James who remains unfazed at calamity. In James 1 verses 3 and 4, it says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. What a statement of faith is that? Not if, but when. When your faith is tested, you will have endurance. So you know what? Let it grow. Can we say that with confidence this morning? Let it come. Whatever that might be, because we, because our joy is not dependent on that. You know, our joy is not dependent on that stock market. It's not dependent on what's going on in my family. It's not dependent on that news from the doctor I'm going to receive tomorrow. My joy is dependent on the Lord. Can we say that with confidence, church? May we surrender our own pursuits of self-interest and lay them down for a pursuit of the cross. It's only there where we will discover inconceivable joy. If, if the worship team wants to come up, I just want to end with this. The only way that you can know joy is to know Jesus. You can be a good person. You can know, of, you can be a good person. You can go to church. You can say the right things, do the right things. You can do everything mom and dad. You can do everything your peers want you to do, right? You could be living the good life. But I want you to take a look at that life. Is it enough? Are you truly happy? Or is there something in your heart that you've been deeply yearning for? Something, a piece of your heart that you've been longing for? A piece, a missing piece to cut out that you can't put a pin on it? If that's you this morning, I humbly suggest take stock in your relationship with the Lord. What is it? Is he calling you? What is he calling you to do? What is he calling you to do? I love, I love GPSs nowadays because I, can take, I take so many wrong paths. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a new driver. I miss the exit so much. I see hands going up as well. I miss, I miss that exit all the time. But if you miss that exit, I'm so thankful that, what does it do? It reroutes, right? So maybe for some of us this morning, this is an opportunity to reroute our lives. This might be an opportunity to say, you know what? Yeah, this way I've been going, this path I've been going, it ain't right. This ain't for me. This isn't, this isn't producing lasting fruit. This isn't where God wants me to go. And I want to posit to us this morning, I want to invite that rerouting noise, that still small voice of the Holy Spirit knocking in each of our hearts. Come back to me. Come back. Come back there. And I promise whatever that is, I promise in that season, I'm not saying that reroute might be easy. It may take you a long way around. Right. But that process of being, being rerouted, that process of making Jesus that primary goal, making Jesus your Lord and your Savior. So worth it. And in that same way that Elizabeth and Mary must have known that joy of just feeling that baby leap within her, just knowing it's real, knowing this is real. God's going to do it. God's going to come through. I guarantee you, not an easy life, but a life that's filled with joy. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray over us this morning. And if, and if this prayer resonates with you, I invite you to seriously consider it. Seriously consider following the Lord, following Jesus, experiencing, not, not just chasing after joy, but just chasing after the one who can bring you joy. Amen? Amen. Join me in prayer, Jesus.